Automation and programmability is a growing necessary skill for network engineering. But do you need to learn to code to get a CCNA? Watch this video to find out. Hi, my name is Rich and welcome to the Rich Tech Guide channel. And in this video, I'm gonna cover the automation section of the CCNA curriculum. And we're gonna go over why it was added, what is in that section, and do you need to learn to code to pass the CCNA exam? But first, if you like this content, go ahead and hit that like button. And uh, also, if you're looking for more of this, check out my other videos around Cisco certifications. And uh, while you're at it, hit the subscribe button as well. Why has this idea of learning to program or code for the CCNA come about? Well, this all stems from Cisco's certification overhaul in 2020. You see, prior to this change, there were multiple CCNA certifications, uh, and each one represented a specific specialization. So you had the CCNA routing and switching, uh, which I got back in the day, and uh, that was considered the core networking CCNA. You also had other CCNAs like the CCNA Security, CCNA Data Center, CCNA Collab, and so on and so forth. Then in 2020, Cisco just wiped away all of those CCNA certifications and replaced them with one single CCNA that was considered the general entry level IT networking certification. Also what happened is if you go back a few years earlier, Cisco recognized a growing need for automation and programmability in computer networking. And so to respond to that, Cisco launched an initiative called DevNet. And this, the purpose of DevNet was to uh, give networking IT people the skills necessary and a tool set to be able to start automating and writing uh, programs for their networks. So we've come right back up to 2020, and with this new CCNA certification, Cisco introduced an automation and programmability section to the CCNA. So if automation and programmability is part of the CCNA, then it must mean we have to learn to code, right? Not so fast. Let's take a look at the automation and programmability section of the CCNA. At the time of filming this, the CCNA curriculum is comprised of six sections. You have network fundamentals, which makes up 20% of the exam. You have network access, which is another 20% of the exam. There is IP connectivity, which makes up 25% of the exam. IP services, which is 10% of the exam. And security fundamentals, which is 15% of the exam. And lastly, automation and programmability for 10% of the exam. The first four sections, which make up 75% of the exam, all cover content around networking and the processes and protocols on the network. 75% of the CCNA exam has to do with networking because at its core, the CCNA is a networking certification. Then you have 15% devoted to security fundamentals. So the reason why this is added is because you need to know how to secure your network. If you do not secure your network, malicious actors out there will exploit it and you're basically going to have a problem. This is also why I've started adding more and more security content to this channel. So if you like that, Go ahead and hit that subscribe button to get that security content as I add it. Lastly, we have the automation and programmability, which makes up 10% of the exam. So, aha, that's where you need to learn to code, right? Well, let's take a look. Let's dive a little bit deeper. And if we expand out the automation and programmability section, 
we find that there are seven subsections to automation in the CCNA. The first of these automation subtopics is 6.1, explain how network automation impacts network management. So I'm gonna go over these on a high level and uh, this one is very straightforward. So on the one hand, you have a network with no automation. And so you wanna make a change to that network or deploy a new device. You're going to have to go to every affected device on the network and log into it and then issue the commands in the CLI to make the configuration change. And you go from device to device to device. On the other hand, you have a network with automation capabilities where you write out a script that has the necessary configuration changes and you deploy it to uh, necessary devices. And it can be to the IP addresses or the host names and the script runs, makes the configuration change, and you're done. Alternatively, networks that have automation capabilities will utilize a centralized controller, which brings us to the second subtopic, 6.2, compare traditional networks with controller-based networking. So this requires an understanding of controller-based networks and some examples of those are going to be Cisco DNA or Cisco ACI, where you have a centralized controller that is pushing policy information out to the devices to make it the necessary configuration changes based on that policy. And from there, we can dive a little bit deeper into 6.3, which is describe controller-based or, and software-defined architectures, the overlay, the underlay, and fabric. And this subtopic gets further broken down into the separation of the control plane and the data plane, and also uh, 6.3.b, northbound and southbound APIs. So let's unpack this. The first is about understanding the architectures that go into software-defined networking. In regards to Cisco ACI, I have some videos about this. I'll link to the first one up above and in the description down below. But when you're looking at the separation of the control and data plane, look at it this way. When you're studying the other 75% of the CCNA curriculum, and you're working with single networking devices, a router or a switch, the thing you have to understand about these devices is they have a control or a management plane and they have a data plane. And when you are logging onto the device and you are issuing commands to the device, or maybe you are pulling uh, diagnostic data or information about what's going on on your network from that device, you're working with that management control plane area. When you have the traffic moving across the device, that's the data plane. So now let's take that concept and let's expand that out to the entire network. And the reason why this is so important and why would we have this separation of a control plane and data plane in software defined or controller based networking is because one of the fundamental tenets of this style of networking is that if that controller goes down or somehow loses access to the subordinate devices on the network, the data and the traffic must still flow. You may not be able to make changes to how the traffic flows. You cannot make policy changes while the controller is not accessible to the network, but you still need to have the data flow until you can regain controller access. Now, the second portion of this is the northbound and southbound APIs. So when we're looking at that, we have, first of all, the southbound APIs are going to be the way the controller pushes the policy to the subordinate devices. So that's going to be how is the controller sending that information to the devices so that way they will make the appropriate configuration changes. The northbound APIs are how we, as humans, interact with that controller. 
So that would be something like a REST API. And now we can move further on into this to the section 6.4, compare traditional campus device management with Cisco DNA Center enabled device management. So remember, traditional device management is you need to make a change, you go one by one to the affected device and you make the configuration changes on each device. This is in contrast to Cisco DNA Center where you create a policy in the Cisco DNA Center and it gets pushed out to uh, all the devices that need that change applied. So next we have describe the characteristics of REST-based APIs things such as CRUD, HTTP verbs, and data encoding. To understand these concepts, we need to understand how a REST API works. So REST stands for Representational State Transfer, and it utilizes the concept of CRUD, uh, or Create, Read, Update, and Delete processes, which are encoded in uh, data formats such as XML, JSON, or YAML. And they are then transmitted to the devices uh, with certain or through the pro protocol of HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol. When we're working with HTTP, there are action commands, also known as HTTP verbs which tell the server to, uh, that, that's receiving the, da the data payload what to do in regards to that data. And that could be post, get, put, patch, or delete. Those are the HTTP verbs. And for more information, I encourage you to check out a video that I made uh, about using REST APIs to automate networks, and I will link it up above and in the description down below. And the next subtopic is hitting the like button. Just kidding, but uh, really, if you, you are enjoying this content, go ahead and hit that like button if you haven't done so already. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Hit that as well. In all seriousness, the next subtopic is 6.6. .6. Recognize the capabilities of configuration management uh, tools or mechanisms such as Puppet, Chef, and Ansible. These are automation tools that you can use on your network uh, to help make the automation an easier process. And this is important to understand the features, functionality, deployment, and differences of these tools. For one example, Puppet and Chef use an agent-based approach where you have to install some sort of an agent onto the devices that, that uh, Puppet and Chef are going to uh, manage and uh, orchestrate or automate. On the other hand, you've got Ansible, which is agent-less and utilizes the APIs of the devices that it supports. And then we get to the final topic of the automation section, and that's 6.7, interpret JSON encoded data. This is probably the closest you will come to actually learning to code for a CCNA. And it still isn't even that close. So JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And despite its name, you don't have to know anything about JavaScript to be able to read JSON encoded data. So back in that 6.5 section, I mentioned uh, three data encoding formats. Based on the topics listed, the CCNA places an emphasis on JSON, most likely because XML is old and outdated and ugh, ugh, ugh. <laughs> YAML is great for anything you want to be human readable but JSON works really well with uh, data automated operations and programming languages, in particular, Python. Uh, and, but it, it does work across other programming languages as well. After going through all of these topics with, with the automation section of the curriculum, it's clear that you 
really don't need to learn how to code in order to get your CCNA. But if you're interested in coding as it relates to the CCNA, let's look at another Cisco certification that was also released uh, during the CCNA overhaul of 2020. Okay, so by now we've established that you don't actually need to learn to code in order to get a CCNA. But understanding networking automation and programmability principles is key to understanding the networks of today and into the future. And that is why the automation section was added to the CCNA curriculum. But what if after studying this automation section, you decide you want to go deeper? You want to learn to write that code. You want to uh, write those scripts to do the automation. Well, Cisco has a certification for you and it's called the DevNet Associate Certification. And it was launched at the same time as the uh, CCNA overhaul. So let's briefly take a look at the exam topics for the DevNet Associate. And it's very clear that the curriculum for this certification has, for the most part, flipped the CCNA curriculum. The DevNet certification has only 15% focused on network fundamentals, with the bulk of the exam 85% focused on automation. Furthermore, if you dive into the subtopics, you will see uh, phrases like construct a Python script or construct code to perform a specific operation. So if you're learning to code and you wanted to apply it to networking, the Cisco DevNet Associate is the certification to focus on. And once you have achieved that certification, you can progress further down that path with the DevNet Professional and DevNet Expert certifications. So if the DevNet certification interests you, go ahead and leave a comment down below and, uh, or maybe you decide you just wanna stick with the CCNA, leave a comment about that down below as well. I hope this video has cleared things up about learning to code and the CCNA certification. Just to reiterate, you do not need to learn to code to get a CCNA, but I will say this, having an understanding of coding concepts, automation processes, and knowing how to read and write code will really help you grow your career in tech and it will help make you a better networking professional as you go forward in computer networking. The networks are going to get more and more complex and require more and more automation. When you enter a career in tech, you are entering a career where you will always be learning. And on that concept of learning, I've linked to some learning resources down below. They are affiliate links, so please, but please feel free to check them out. And uh, also, if you made it this far into the video, so go ahead and hit that like button. And uh, if you want to see more of this content, go check out my other videos and hit that subscribe button as well. As I said, a career of, in tech is a career of always learning. So keep learning, keep improving, keep studying, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.